This programme was funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with a television licence fee. The shot was heading to Goldberg and it hits uh, Pat Hoban. Once again, the player set the corner, it's going to be a throw in. Hello, and welcome to the second part of this two part series on the history of Dundalk FC. I'm Orla Crilly. And I am Jason Kelly. Over the next 45 minutes, we'll be taking a look at life after McLaughlin, relegation, promotion, success, and dominance. Dundalk FC. 1984 to 2022. In the last episode, the year was 1983 and Jim McLaughlin had just ended his nine-year spell at the club. Dundalk finished mid-table for the next two seasons before former player Turlock O'Connor was appointed as player manager ahead of the league split into two divisions in 1985-86. It would not take him long to get a team together that would challenge for silverware. To tell us more about Turlock O'Connor's time at the club. We spoke to Dunlock FC historian and local sports journalist Niall Nabry. Yeah, Turlock O'Connor, um, like obviously it would have come in, obviously, well, Jim McLaughlin left the club um, and then John Dempsey would have been the manager at one stage and I think um, Tommy Connolly had a spell in charge as well. But then Tommy Connolly and Turlock would have sort of worked together from 1985, I think it was, um, onwards. And Turlock O'Connor, I, su- I suppose, sort of built what I'd refer to as maybe the third great and dog team like after maybe Alan Fox's team in the late 60s and um, Jim McLaughlin's team in the 70s and you know obviously Turlock O'Connor would have had good success with at Lone Town in and around that period when McLaughlin was managing us came in built a whole new team you know we had you know obviously incredible players you know Alan O'Neill obviously like R- uh, Richie Blackmore was the goalie under um, Jim McLaughlin he departed at this stage but Alan O'Neill comes in becomes an, another great goalkeeper for us. You have you have you know Martin Lawler was still at the club. You know I suppose a link with the Jim McLaughlin team in the seventies. You know you have some great local talent. You know Barry Kyo, Desi Gorman. You know some great local talent in the club as well at that time. Even other like Gino Lawless. You know Martin Murray. These are all tremendous players, and you know took a couple of years I suppose, took a couple of seasons to kind of get them to where I suppose Torrey kind of wanted them to get to. Um. And in 1986-87, they finished runners-up in the league and then just lost out in the cup final. They were very close to, to having great success that year, but it was the following season when I think Turlock's team really cemented their greatness like because they ended up winning the league the following season. You know, they didn't, obviously, maybe hurting from the previous year, won the league in what's a season that, unfortunately, I'm too young to remember, but, you know, people who you'll speak to and even you read up about it as well, you know, there was a tremendous... It was a tremendous team, and people always revert back to that team as a, which was a great team to watch. And um, they won the league championship. They played Derry City, and that was a tremendous Derry City team. And um, this is a year before, only a season before Derry won the treble in '89. They're still the only club they've done that. And um, the year before that, the Dot played them in the FAI Cup final in um, in Dalymount, and um, you know won the game via a penalty. You know. I've got the full game on a VHS tape at home somewhere, and I've watched it back a few times. The Dot got a penalty in that game. That was. You know, if VAR existed, had have existed back then, it's probably we might not have ever won the cup that season. You know, but uh, John Cleary, in, in any case, and Barry Keogh was fouled, I believe, and John Cleary um, stepped up to take it and scored, obviously, and that was the only goal of the game. And it's a decision that Derry fans to this day will will contest. Like you know, um, I was up there only a few weeks back, and you know they'll still contest that to this very day. Um, that that was never a penalty and. Probably wasn't, but I'm sure we've had our own wrongdoings as well down the line too. But it was a tremendous team. Um, they obviously went on after that, played in Europe. You know, obviously we've already mentioned they played Ajax in Europe. But that's in and around that period. Um, and then you know they won the league again in '91, and you know um, like the last day of the season, they they, they travelled down to Cork, 
um, played against um, Cork City, and it was basically like sort of like the 2014 game with Kenny. Like these were the top two sides, and it was a winner takes all kind of match. Like and Dundalk won the game one nil. Tom McNulty scored that famous goal, um, and he was another player who kind of came in maybe in the second part of um, Turlock O'Connor's spell. Came back to the club. Um, he was a great Scottish midfield player who settled in the town. Like you know what I mean, and I believe he's still living in the town. But um, he was a tremendous midfield player. You know, a no nonsense midfielder who might get away with some of the challenges he made nowadays. But a tremendous midfield player, and he he got the all decisive goal in that game. And the dog won the league again in ninety one. Um, and I think they went on to play Kish Past Honved in the European Cup. Then the following season, and probably should have beaten them. You know, and this is actually the last season before the. The European Champions Cup became the UEFA Champions League. So then Dog, you know, I think the Drew in Hungary won all with Kish Past Honved and then unfortunately lost an Oriel um in the return leg. But then Dog probably should have beaten Kish Past Honved in that match and you know, um but you know, yeah, Turlock O'Connor um, built some tremendous success at the club and um he's somebody with Jim McLaughlin, Stephen Kenny, Alan Fox will forever be embedded into the history of Den Dog he as a really, really successful manager. Why did he leave the club, do you know? Yeah, like, it's a strange one with Turlock O'Connor because, you know, in 1993, um, they got to the cup final and they played Shelburne at the old Lansdowne Road, um, as it was. Um, and, you know, they lost to Shelburne that day um, in the cup final. They finished fourth in the league championship, but um, they were actually only a point. It was a very tight league that year, and even though Dundalk had finished fourth, they were only a point of actually winning it. So when you think about it, football can be a fickle game at times. And, you know, Dundalk were essentially the width of a post of winning another double, a second double under Turlock O'Connor. Now, Turlock stayed on for the beginning of the 93-94 season. Um, but, you know, a bit of an indifferent start to that year. Um, you know, obviously, if this is following on from the disappointment maybe of not winning either trophy in 93, you know, um, then the following, the following season, the, the 93-94 campaign, there was a bit of an, an indifferent start to the campaign and I think in and around October, you know, and crowds, you know, Jim Murphy's, uh, the literature um, that Jim Murphy um, wrote um, would suggest as well that like, you know, crowds were starting to dwindle um, at Orly Park. The club was kind of in a bit of financial trouble um, and then in and around somewhere in October 93, um, this all coincided with um, Turtle Corner's departure from the club, um, which, you know, I I I I wouldn't say it was you know it, it just kind of maybe references the, the the fickleness of of football sometimes. I remember talking to um another local journalist recently who would have been around back in those days, and he was saying even towards the end of Turlock O'Connor's reign that like you know there was crowds, you know maybe there was a bit of booing and stuff like that, and towards the end, which is incredibly harsh, I suppose, but given the success Turlock had. But I mean, that's just the fickleness of football fans. You you can become the victim of your own success sometimes. Um, and when you set the bar so high like Turlock O'Connor did with those great teams in 88 and 91, you know, you're setting, it's very difficult to replicate that again and build another great team, which he was, you know, it was very difficult to do that, you know, and obviously the financial difficulties around Dundalk FC at the time probably didn't help matters. So he would have lost players. You know, I think a good few players would have the part of the club. Some of his stalwarts would have the part of the club as well after that cup final in 93. So unfortunately, that was kind of how it ended for Turlock O'Connor. Um, and I think he went off. He went on to manage Bohemians then, I think, after that, um, until the late 90s then. So, yeah, no, he, he, but overall, I think, you know, history-wise, you know, he was, he was he's certainly up there with our greatest ever managers. And this club's had a lot of managers down the years. And, you know, Turlock O'Connor, Jim McLaughlin, Alan Fox, Stephen Kenny would be easily in the top five, obviously, yeah. Dermot Keeley replaced O'Connor and in 1995, he led the club to their ninth title on a shoestring budget. The ex-dub, who was part of the 79 McLaughlin title winning team, scooped the title on the last day of the season with a 2-0 win over Galway. Tom McNulty scored in the 75th minute and Mick Doohan secured victory six minutes later. But it wasn't until news came true that Derry Sishy and Shelburne had both failed to win that Dundalk were crowned champions. The title in 95 didn't stop the downward spiral the club was in. Keeley quit halfway through the title defending season stating frustration at not being able to strengthen his team. Dundalk were nearly relegated the following season and survived a promotion-relegation playoff. 
Jim McLaughlin returned to Oriel Park to try and turn things around, but after having to transfer list the whole squad, the club was relegated from the top tier of Irish football 20 years to the day after they had won their first double. Change was afoot at Oriel Park. There was talks about a supporters who up taking over the club. Kieran Cannon remembers the first match he went to and remembers of the community investing in the club at the time. First game was a 3-2 win over Kilkenny City. I still remember it as if it was yesterday. I was sitting in the main stand and we won very, very kind of late in the game. Terry Evanson was manager. He was a former player of the club who had come back and, you know, the club had just been relegated. It was their first year in the first division. And he was set a, a kind of a task in order to get them promoted kind of pretty much back up straight away. That didn't that didn't work out the way that, you know, it would have wanted. But coincidentally, it was also the first night that the ownership, there had been a change of ownership of the club, but it had gone from um, the previous ownership to a cooperative shares uh, type model. And Des Denning had just been installed as chairman, a great man for the club and a great man for, for the town as well. He was an insurance broker and in, in, he was originally from County Cavan. Um, he came in as as chairman and it was just kind of it all kind of all clicked together. You know, my first game happened to be the night that the, the co-op had their first game. There was a big win. There was a good buzz about the place. It was also because of new ownership and because it was now a situation that fans could buy 100 euros worth their worth of shares that they became kind of stakeholders in the club. So there was kind of that first kind of feeling model of, of the club being owned by the community. The supporters co-op officially took over the club in March of the new millennium. Dundalk fans expected an immediate return to the Premier Division after their relegation in 1999, but it wasn't until the 2000-2001 season that the club would challenge for the First Division title. Martin Murray took over as manager, replacing Terry Eviston during the summer. The club also had to recruit lots of new players. Ten local lads had been retained from the previous year's team, but a total of 21 players made debuts that year. Dundalk got off to a good start, topping the table by the end of the first month of the league, but a dip in form and an outbreak of foot and mouth led to the postponement of fixtures and they struggled to get back on form. United Park in Drogheda hosted a few home games during this time, but the league was won at the first game back in Oriel Park in over two months. Dundalk beat at Lone Town 2-1 to win the First Division title for the first time and promotion to the Premier League with a game to spare. The following year, the league was reduced from 12 teams to 10 and Dundalk were among the teams relegated. Favourite player of all time? In Dundalk? Yes. Yeah. Patrick McElhenney. Okay. Who's your favourite player? Uh, Duffy. Cherry. How's yours, David? Uh, Dave McMillan. Dave McMillan, yeah, good player. Who's your favourite Dundalk FC players of all time? Probably Tough one. You say me, I'll say you. That's good news. <laughs> Alright, go say me. Is that a fair? Chris Shields. Darren Horgan. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favourite players? Frank Gartland. Yeah. Shepherd, the keeper is mine. Nathan Shepherd. Frank Gartland. Was, uh, um, Adams. Favourite player? Hoban. Patrick Hoban. Patrick Hoban and Stephen Bradley. McCarry. Definitely my favourite player. He's unreal. He's unreal. Yeah, he's unreal. Yeah. I think it's Nathan Shepherd. He's one of the best keepers in the league. Probably Dermot Keeley. Daryl Lee, he is it? Yeah. yeah. Pa Huben. Have you a favourite chant, favourite song? Come on, the town. After that relegation, Dundalk FC spent the next four seasons in the lower reaches of the First Division, with no sign of promotion. The co-op members agreed to the club being taken back into private ownership by Jerry Matthews, who was CEO at the time. In 2006, John Gill's Dundalk team had a playoff tie against Waterford United after finishing second in the league. Despite winning, they were denied promotion due to the FAI's 2006 IAG report and the third-place Galway were promoted instead. It wasn't until 2008 that Dundalk FC were promoted to the Premier Division on the final night of the season. Gill was let go, even though he won the First Division title. We had got to a point where we'd spent seven years, or seven seasons, in the First Division. 
and we got back into the Premier under John Gill. John um, wasn't un- unfortunately lost his job despite getting promotion. But then Sean Connor came in, um, finished mid table, maybe spent above budget. I think that season, you know, I think Sean Connor, I suppose, fleeced the whole squad, like, and you know, brought in, you know, a team that's probably akin to the Wimbledon crazy gang, like, you know what I mean? In in England, like, there were it was sort of a, an insane sort of period for the club. But that being said, they stabilised. They they finished in a mid table position. Um, Ian Foster came in, who's now doing quite well with the English FA. I think he's the England under nineteen manager. He brought a bit more stability again. We were mid table again, but we weren't really pushing on. But unfortunately, after like, Ian Foster had left the club in at the end of the 2011 season, I think, and um, Sean McCaffrey, who's then now late Sean McCaffrey, I suppose, um, is like he, he comes in to sort of replace Ian Foster, and he's got a tremendously difficult job because there's there's no money at the club, so he's got to bring in a team of unknown young uh, young players basically. And like Monaghan United, like, there was a lot of financial difficulty surrounding the league around this time. Um, Monaghan United were actually ahead of the dock in the league, I think. Um, the dock were bottom in the league and Monaghan were ahead of the dock and um, I think they just beaten us in Oriel I was at that game and that was probably like one of the most disastrous games I remember because we actually took the lead I think and I think Robbie Doyle might have got two goals for Monaghan and we were bottom of the table I think. and Monaghan eventually had to pull out of the league though which you never like to see a club I suppose pulling out of the league but it probably worked in our favour because we ended up getting the reprieve of a playoff against Waterford which we ended up winning over two legs and um, staying in the Premier Division but in the build up to all that you know all that kind of negativity on the pitch there was also a lot of negativity off the pitch like the club was in a bad financial state um, and like, like I said and like you mentioned there like the Save Our Club movement was formed and had to be formed because the club was literally like it was very it was it was on a knife edge I suppose and it was very very close to, for, to, to sort of falling into liquidation and or extinction and it was hours away from that and I remember being, even being in my own house you know talking to people and like talking to my family about it and we were talking like is there going to be a new club are we going to be able to form a new club under maybe a new holding company and maybe to start afresh in the first division or even below the first division Leinster Senior League even and um, that was genuinely the talk at the time and like obviously the Save Our Club movement and people like Dean Arrowsmith would have been great people at the time who would have been and others as well um, would have been behind it and I went to the meetings myself I remember being, I, I, I remember there was a couple of them there was one at the YDC um, I think there was over like 100 people attended that meeting um, it was in and around July 2012 or something there was a summer 2012 so about 10 years ago now and um, there was about 100 people at that meeting and I remember like it was a very very like it was a fundraiser I suppose and a lot of ex-players for the club had donated like old jerseys and memorabilia and stuff had been auctioned off. There was fundraisers, raffles, all this kind of stuff. Um, obviously there was act like there was music and stuff there for people, you know, were buying drinks at the at the YDC and stuff. And it was all fundraising and um but even being there, like I remember being there with, with a friend that, that that night at that particular meeting and like it was just somber as well because you're thinking like is this all going to be for nothing? Like, is are we going to have a club? Because at that point, we, we really didn't know. And it actually wasn't looking good at all at that stage, if I recall. It wasn't looking good at all. Like, I remember, like, like th- th- we'd begging buckets. Like, we were going around with begging buckets um, outside Oriel in around town. Some of the clubs, I remember there was clubs of other supporters that season who would have, you know, bought away tickets and would have paid double just to kind of help the dock SE out. And it, it sort of showed you the solidarity of the League of Ireland, I suppose, as well, that... You know, we didn't want to see another club, two clubs in the one year, I suppose, um, go go bust. And with the great respect to Monaghan United, you know, Dundalk would be a more historical club and it probably would be more disastrous for the league had Dundalk, a club of Dundalk stature, actually had to pull out of the League of Ireland. But yeah, it was a very precarious time and we literally just didn't know. Like it was 50-50 whether we were going to have a team the following season. And I remember my sentiments at the time were, we're probably better off getting relegated, you know, starting afresh just in the first division if we can and that was actually a glass half full um, mentality at the time because we might have had a club at all and we were very 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 lucky to, to to stay afloat yeah what happened was we were hours from closing and the fundraisers and all that aside which were brilliant and there were so many great people too many to mention who contributed and helped the club but then you know Paul Brown and Andy Connolly buy the club you know, um, they were two local businessmen, and we didn't really know. Like to to me and the rest, I, and the rest of the supporters, I suppose it was just kind of like we were just relieved that maybe we're going to have a stable sort of, not necessarily win things, but we're going to have a stable sort of club that might just be 
avoiding relegation maybe and might just be kind of existing in the league for a couple of years and then we'll see where we are. But then I remember all the rumours starting to circulate that, you know, Stephen Kenny, who had just been who'd been fired from Shamrock Rovers actually um, a few months beforehand, was Andy Connolly and Paul Brown were trying to get uh, were, trying, were trying to persuade Stephen Kenny to come down. And he and he needed some persuasion. Um he needed some persuasion because I remember at the time Limerick FC um were, were planning big things at the time. And they were also keen on bringing Stephen Kenny to the club. And it could have been a very different story. Like, Steve, Let's face it, Dundalk had just finished bottom of the league. Had needed a playoff to stay in the league. Um, had nearly gone extinct. You know, had, had no players signed up. So it would have been a tough sell for someone of Stephen Kenny's stature to bring him down to Dundalk and manage the club. But Con- like Andy Connolly and Paul Brown managed to pull it off. And I suppose the rest is history. Like, you know, like none of us could have um, foresaw the rapid change in from going like as you said from going like from having conversations about are we going to have a club at all to what was it four years after that playing in the Europa League group stages and get and, and picking up points it's actually a remarkable story like you know what I mean like it's it's a remarkable sport and story like it, it really is and it's it's almost impossible to even imagine that happening like um, because the club was actually and you're right it was it was hours away from going from absolutely going and not existing, ceasing to exist. And four years after that, kind of precarious situation, we're witnessing a team which is financially stable, is able to sign players on long-term contracts, has, is bringing in a great gate, like the, we're, we're getting great attendances, and we're in the Europa League group stages compete, and competing. And, you know, we still went into the last game of that group stage with a chance of progression to the last 32. So, like, it's a remarkable story, and it was, and I suppose that was the turning point. It was the fun, it was like, Obviously, the fundraising and the Save Our Club movement were, 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 were a driving force, but then for Paul Brown and Andy Connolly to actually come in and take it up and and take a massive risk, I suppose, for, for themselves. Because it would have been a massive risk. Like I, I can't even calculate, or I, I probably, it's probably best we don't quite try and quantify the debt the club must have been in at that stage. But they were able to pick it up, and the success that they built um, will, will probably never be replicated. Stephen Kenny came to Dundalk in November 2012 after failing to win any of their first five home games. They managed to return the season around and finished second in the league. This laid the foundations for what would become one of the most successful periods in their club's history. We caught up with a number of Dundalk FC players who will tell us about this era of the club's history. We've talked to Patrick Coburn, Brian Garden. David McMillan and Andy Boyle. But first up is ex-player and current manager Stephen O'Donnell. I think it can be understated sometimes that the job he did do here and nearly probably his best achievement could have been coming second in the first season in 2013 with a whole new group. We ran to St. Pat's quite close that season and then obviously managed to build on it but straight from the get-go. He was. Uh, we were really competitive, as I said, with a whole new team that club that had just been nearly relegated the season before. So it rarely happens that uh, two teams neck and neck go and play each other in the, the last game of the season. And obviously, I was out injured for a good period of time coming up to that season or uh, coming up to that game, and um, just got back a couple of weeks beforehand, um, and then got sort of thrown into the game and just adrenaline carries you through and it wasn't the cleanest strike in the world but it went in but definitely one of the highlights for me personally uh, on my career you, you know the goal and just the night in itself and, and winning the game and, and the club winning winning the league and what was the start of a of a great journey then the last time I had goosebumps on the back of my neck when I was walking out for that 2014 last game of the season the Cork game 2014 here the first league title winning it in front of our own fans and I suppose going to the wire like a cup final and that, uh, yeah, that's one of that's probably up there for me. 2014, uh, win the league last game of the season um, was I think I'll never forget that. Uh, just the joy, the atmosphere, um, it was just unbelievable how the game went as well. Half time, the team talk at half time, I'll never forget about it. Um, Stephen Kenny was really calm in it and relaxing us all and. Um, he just said we're going to win this game and thankfully we did. After winning their 10th league title and the league cup by defeating Shamrock Rovers 3-2 in Oil Park, the town were off to Europe again. They easily beat Yanis Esk 5-1 on aggregate 
Up next was Hajduk Split in the Europa League second qualifying round. Hajduk Split away and I just thought their crowd was phenomenal. They didn't stop from minute one all through the half-time break to the last minute. And it was a great achievement from us over there as well. We got a very good result. We came out 2-1 winners. We nearly got through to the next stage and um, yeah, it was a great atmosphere. Although Dundalk were knocked out of Europe, it was not the furthest they'd go. 2015 brought more success to the club. Dundalk won the club's third league and FAI Cup double and the Leinster Senior Cup. The league was won by 11 points. Cork were beaten 1-0 in the FAI Cup after extra time and Shamrock Rovers lost 3-1 to Dundalk in the Leinster Senior Cup. Dundalk would have a decent run in Europe until they were beaten by Bate Borisov in the second qualifying round of the Champions League. Probably in Bate as well, the first year we played them, I'd had a chance earlier in the game and, and missed it. Uh, and this one kind of came about, luckily, uh, a bit of a ricochet, put me in one-on-one and I managed to finish it. Um, I think that put us on level terms at the time. We, uh, we lost the game, I think, 2-1 over there, but it was a decent result. Away goals counted at that point, so it was a big goal. This would be put right the next time they faced them. They retained the league title in 2016, were runners-up in the FAI Cup and were back in Europe against familiar opposition. Dundalk became the first League of Ireland club to register a win in the Europa League group stages. They drew one all with Alkmaar and picked up a win against Maccabi Tel Aviv. In 2017, they won the League Cup and ended up FAI Cup and League runner-ups. Peak Six took over the club in January of 2017 and the following year, Kenny won another league and cup double, breaking the points total and goal scored total. Next, you will hear the voices of Joan Murphy and the Dunlock FC players mentioned earlier as they recount some of their best moments in football. You will also hear extracts from Dunlock FM's match day commentary team of Joan Murphy, Jer Conlon and Gussie Herdy. Look at all the wonderful triumphs that Dundalk have had, winning cups and leagues, uh, playing uh, all these U- European teams. Takes it back again to Zurich, to me, like you know what I mean. That it's all there's a story behind every game for me, like you know. Probably the one that sticks out is the bad day game in Tala. We probably touched on the two moments that I always look back on as being the biggest, and the first was probably that game in Tala against Bate. Um, there was no medal for that, certainly, but we were knew we were going into a playoff to qualify for the Champions League, and I think that was just a, a crescendo moment for so much good that had happened in the previous couple of years with, under Stephen Kenny. Dal Hogan tries to go down the lane, does he? He does, he cuts back in his right foot, gets a ball in, and McMillan has his... Yeah! Goal! Yeah, goal! Yes. A wonderful goal! Oh, yeah! What a goal! No doubt about it! The first goal against Bate in the, the game in Tala. It's just such a big game and if I remember correctly Daryl Horgan put in a brilliant ball for me at the back post and got my head on it and, and knocked it past the keeper and I think it was close to, to half time in the game and obviously we were 1-0 down from the first leg so that put us on level terms going in at half time and um, yeah it was a really big goal. Gives it back to McElhaney, McElhaney on one of his wild runs, he's cutting inside. Yes! Yeah! Oh! Yes! That's another goal! I don't believe it! A wonderful goal! Paddy Barrett! Retrieved the ball in the by lane, got a crossover. He was there, only that man again, David McMillan. Just that night in general, Robbie Benson's third goal, uh, the rain pouring down, and the celebrations, it was just a, a magical moment, I think. Dal Hogan again, midfield, loses it out, comes to Kentish, he plays the shot run. Robbie Benson's team through and goal. Can he put it in? Yeah! yeah! Yes, it's, it's over! over. It's, over. It's, over. it's all over! It's over! Robbie Benson! A bad pass back was intercepted by Robbie Benson. He's clean through on goal. The goalkeeper comes out. He advances, but Robbie, Robbie just knocks the ball past him. And Kala has erupted here. Has erupted. I've erupted. Gussie has Unbelievable. erupted. Adam Bone has erupted. And why not? This is something I never thought I'd see in me life. But it's here. It's happening in front of us. This is what football is all about. This is why we love football. The ups and downs of it. The night we're on the right end of it. We're on the up. And what a display by this Dundalk team. Just a feel of knowing that we had guaranteed European uh, group stages uh, at a minimum Europa League. It was a brilliant feel. I remember obviously 
the weather and stuff like that, the rain was pouring down, but it was an amazing, um, it was an amazing feeling, as I said, to, to make sure that we, we guaranteed to make it into the Europe League group stage at the very minimum. The night we beat um, Bade Boris off in Tallaght to sort of guarantee us European football, I know we went and played Warsaw in the next round, but we guaranteed minimum. The Europa League, I think just winning the game 3-0 and... When Robbie went through and, and scored the third goal, you knew that was, to, at the death, you knew that was the game over, and the just sort of sense of elation, I suppose, and knowing that you, you had achieved something. Um, that I think that was the most most memorable night, and I think the pouring rain, everything helped helped it in regards to atmosphere and in the game. Uh, we played well. We had been sort of well beaten the week before, lost one nil over there. We're lucky to lose only one nil, um, but turned it around in Tallinn. Uh, as I said, the dressing room after and just that night in general with the supporters was 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 the most memorable. I think, yeah. It's good. I remember obviously, <laughs> probably the the main thing that sticks out was the coming back on the plane after, and we were on. The, I think everyone was on the runway, and uh, we missed whatever take off time by a minute, and we had to stay on the night. Uh, it was it was just at the, probably at this point at the end to we thought we had a great chance of going through to the the last uh, twenty two or sixteen, whatever it may be, but. Um, it was just one of them nights and um, the stadium and all was nice when we got the game another one I think we finished 2-1 didn't it that we were, we were right in and um, listen it wasn't a be but the, the memories of the, that, that run in the Europa League group size was amazing really we had a chance to go through if we'd won the game out there and results had gone in a favour in, in, uh, in the other match that we still had a chance to go through so that was that's obviously what we were after, is trying to win out there. And in the end, we, we probably shot ourselves in the foot a little bit. Um, but it wasn't to be. But there, as I said, an amazing experience overall. Yeah, um, I think, I always remember that, I think it was the October of it, that we had a, a mad run of games, playing every two or three days. I think one game, and obviously the, power, the Zenit game, we came back. I think we played out there in the tours. They stayed over, overnight and flew back on the Friday and then straight to the cup final on, on the Sunday, which is... Amazing, like when you look back on on things like that, it, would, it was brilliant. Um, but as I said, the overall feeling though, is that we were probably disappointed in the end that we weren't able to go through. And then obviously to go on, like if realistically, if it had been said in pre season or first season that come 2016 you'd be in the group stage of the Europa League and you'd be after winning, I don't know, uh, two leagues on the way to winning another league and a cup, you know. You wouldn't have believed it, would you? No chance, you would have said, no way, you know. It so just shows you when you look back that. The level of achievement from him, and it was obviously him that instigated it all, you know. But uh, and then 2018, um, 2018 was, you know, was a good one because after 2017, everyone thought that was us finished. That was the little dynasty over of the few years of, of dominating. Um, so that was a real, um, real joy and a you know sense of accomplishment that you roll back in and and you sweep the league and the cup and, and you do a double um, because I suppose when you look back it's the teams that when the chips are against them and then things happen or they have to rebuild and you lose a lot of players um, to me that's that's a real sense of accomplishment um, for character personality yeah the lads that were still here and that were being questioned in 2017 that it uh, it's a nice sense of achievement then to, to go back and do that um I just think we were we in the side there that was just prime and ready to kick on and um, you know we didn't lose many games that year and we were on the front foot for basically the whole year and sure we are, our midfield was unbelievable our back four was unbelievable you know so you know everything was just team unity the spirit in the, in the dressing room full belief that we were going to go and win every game and win the league and to win the cup After Stephen Kenny left the club Vinnie Pert took over as manager of Dundalk FC. He led the team to a President Cup, League title and League of Ireland Cup in 2019 and a 7-1 aggregate win over Linfield in the Champions Cup. A dramatic 5-4 sudden death penalty shootout against Riga got them through to the second qualifying round of the Champions League. Carabag knocked them out of that competition and a 4-1 aggregate loss to Slovan Bratislava ended that year's spell in Europe. Vinnie Perth was sacked in his second season as manager following Dunlop's exit from the first qualifying round of the Champions League. The domestic league started 
on the 14th of February and was due to finish in October. Jordan Flores scored an unbelievable goal early in the season, which was later nominated for the Pockers Award in a 3-2 loss against Shamrock Rovers in Tala. In March 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic brought football matches to a standstill all over the world and the league did not resume until the 31st of July with a shortened 18 match schedule when matches did return it was behind closed doors Dundalk struggled to find their form in the league without the support of fans in Oil Park oh, it's a, like, Honestly it's shocking it's, it's difficult as a as a footballer playing without fans because then it kind of feels like a becoming closed door friendly really um, but it wasn't like those points at stake and I think as a club we probably felt that the most really um, we try off the fans you see the, the, the difference they make and it's even for the opposing players it's a hostile place to come when the fans are back and uh, making it difficult for them so I think um, I like listen it's, as I said it's chalk and cheese really I think it was shown the massive in lockdown you know the effect it has on the team when we don't have the, our crowd here behind us at home our results were, were poor not even that our intensity in our game and energy I think was lacking and I think that was due to the, to that fact partly um, and then when the crowd returned you know so did the home results um, it really is a strong sort of 12th man as you say and it, it galvanises it but it also it gives the players a bit more confidence a bit more belief a bit more energy and and that's what a home crowd should do, you know, and we're very lucky and fortunate to have a crowd like that. With nine matches to go, Dundalk appointed a new manager, Flebo Givinoli, whose Dundalk team qualified for the group stages of the Aerobic League. We spoke to Kieran Callan about this period of the club's history. The owner's father, Bill, would take over as chairman. The process began to hire a new manager. John Gill and Alan Reynolds were in interim charge. Then they decided to leave. And then a decision was decided to bring in a new management team. A phone call was made to a man by the name of Filippo Giovagnoli um, to become manager of the club. He said about that. He said that he wanted to get the team qualified for Europe. His focus was on Europa League qualification. He did that in the most incredible way. I think. While a lot of people were very much uh, impressed with our performance against the team from the Faroe Islands, it was the victory over Sheriff that really kind of stands out because they are a team that's now played in Champions League. They've they've done such incredible things for a small t- like a small club, so to speak, that has a very big backing behind them. But Filippo and Giuseppe, by all accounts, from speaking to both of them at different stages, they're two very very good fellas. But They weren't qualified to coach the team and that led to problems. Um, It led to problems in the UEFA Europa League in which there was accusations of shadow coaching. Um, The FEI then had to get involved. They had to try and get them onto a pro license course. That was impossible, which led to yet another change in management structure within the club. But all of this could have been averted if a pro license candidate had been put forward first a pro licensed candidate that the players could have entrusted in, but also somebody that knew the league. And I think that that was probably Bill's biggest, you know, mistake. We got, we qualified for Europe um, at the end of the 2020 season, which was a very difficult year for everybody involved at the club, not just on the pitch, but off the pitch as well. You know, I think if Bill had done his business right, if he was to look back on it, Yes, Filippo and Giuseppe had done a great job in, you know, qualifying us for Europe for the following year and getting us through the to Europa League group stages. Also, COVID had a massive problem with it as well because there was it created this massive vacuum in the sense that the club supporters were completely detached from what was going on. There were lads watching the games from across the wall. There was protests outside. Jim Jetlin became the club's new sporting director at the end of 2020. There was a reshuffling of management at the club due to the problems with the UEFA Pro Licence. Shane Keegan became the first team manager, replacing Filippo in June 21. Vinnie Perth returned to the club 
but they struggled in the league and were in the relegation playoff spots near the bottom of the table. They eventually turned things around and finished the year in sixth place near the end of the season. The club was sold to a local stadium led by former co-owner Andy Connolly and sports tech firm Stad Sports. My first game in Oriel Park was in 1964. How long have you been coming to matches? Oh, like four years now. Two years. Season ticket for the last two years and I suppose six months before that, the previous season. Yeah. My mother used to take us when we were kids on a Sunday afternoon. Three o'clock kick-off. Oh, years. I'm, I, I live in Dublin and he lives in Dublin. We both, we're from the yeah. north but we won't uh, come up, you know, not every yeah. week, but as often as we can. And have you any hopes for the club? What would you like to see happen? Uh, a bit more of a stadium built up. Where would you like to see them dock in the future? Viva. In the future, I'd like to see them in the Champions League group stages, winning the league again, get back to the good old days. Uh, hopefully a few trophies. That's it, that's all you can hope, hope for, isn't it? What are you looking forward a to? A new stadium, number, number one. A new stadium and a community spirit. And I'd, love, I'd just love to see Oriel Park done up. State of the art stadium. Let's dream on, like, you know. <laughs> uh, what do you think the dog fans can look forward to? over the next couple of years? Europe this year, I'm sure that's a certainty. And then just build on it and then hopefully a bit more investment from the owners, you know, once they've had a bit more time to invest in the club infrastructure and then also players. And then group stages next year, maybe Conference League, I think that's definitely a target. Would you like to play for the dog someday? Yes, I would. She is playing at the football at the minute, aren't you? Yeah. Are you playing with? Yeah, Key Celtic. And would you like to play for them yourself someday? Yeah. You're playing with loads at the minute, aren't you? Yeah. Playing with rock and loads. You're looking forward to the match? Your first yeah. game. Your first game. What are you looking forward to? What do you think it's going to be like? Uh, I think it's going to be fun. Do you think you might come back again? Yeah. What do you think your score will be? 3-0. 10 Every fifth yeah, night four, since four, 1952. Yeah. Um, since uh, 2021. Monday time. Hey. Stephen O'Donnell was appointed as manager of Dundalk FC for the 2022 season. We are halfway through the season and Dundalk sits second in the league. When we spoke to them, we asked them if you could say anything to Dundalk fans, what would you say? Um, I suppose I can only thank them for the, the way they've, they've, they've taken to myself and even like, as I said before, they have my family coming up there, they're always brilliant with them. They um, always look after them and uh, it's, this place is a massive, massive play, a spot in my heart. And, um, and as I said, like it's, it's, I can only thank them really for what they've done for us. I think uh, they've been absolutely phenomenal this year. Um, they've definitely been our 12th man. Um, see, at home, to drive us on, our home record speaks for itself. Um that's not just about what we're doing on the pitch, it's about what they're doing off the pitch as well for us in terms of cheering us on and backing us 100%. And, you know, we are in a kind of new re- regime here um, under new management, new ownership, and everything seems to be working perfectly so far. And we're, we are still in the building phase, and, and I think they they appreciate that and they understand that. And, um, and at the moment, we are second in the league, and... I just think we're going to get stronger and stronger and hopefully that will be the outcome. Um, just thanks for all your support. Uh, we're going to need it for the second half of the season. A lot of our players are in their first senior football, um, first season of senior football, so their encouragement and their support is huge. Uh, it gives lads such confidence uh, to go and express themselves. So no different than what they have been. They're great supporters. I even find that with players that leave and that, you know, the, the messages... They have that little bit of, I don't know, class and that, that their message, all good look messages with a lot of players that would have left and that I think once they see players and a team working really hard, you can build a great rapport with the Dundalk fans. So that's what you want. I think we're getting there. I think there is a good rapport with the supporters and the players and long may that continue. And as I said, we're going to need them at different stages of the second half of the season and um you know, that's when really their support becomes huge of helping a player go that extra couple of yards, maybe make that extra sprint to get a block or get back around, whatever it may be. Um, and no different to what they have been, you know. This has been the history of Dundalk Football Club and we look forward to what the future brings. Thanks to everyone who joined us over the last 45 minutes for part two of this two-part documentary on the history of Dundalk Football Club. 
Thanks to Dundalk FM for their assistance in making this documentary, David Bellew on sound and Tara Tyne for collecting Vox Pops. We'd also like to thank our interviewees, John Murphy, Kieran Callan, Niall Newbury and all the amazing Dundalk FC fans who took part in this documentary. Also a massive thanks to all the Dundalk FC volunteers, staff, players and management, past and present. This is Orla Crilly. And I've been Jason Kelly. See you next time. You, you have to appreciate the good times and the bad times in equal measure because you just don't know when the flick of the switch is going to happen. And the Dock's always been a community-based club. Like, going back many years, the people in this town own the club. Do you know what I mean? It's, 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 it's their club and it always will be their club. And it's wonderful because the whole town, it's great to walk up the town and see kids with a Dundalk jersey on them. You want young people in the town to be looking up to somebody and saying like, well, that guy went to my school so I can do what he's doing, I can be captain and rock. Most of the kids you see, oh Dundalk jersey, you don't find that in many other places in Ireland. People have come in, you feel part of the club again. You know the football people that want to do well for Dundalk, not only for Dundalk, for the town for the country. This programme was funded by the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland with a television licence fee.